there is no project in this office that we don't make room for design and design every aspect of it with a lot of care. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I am speaking with Harshad Pillai, who is one of the directors of Fogarty Finger, which is an architecture firm who are committed to redefining the urban built environment through projects that are as evocative as they are pragmatic. So Harshad is currently overseeing the development of a whopping 3 million square feet of projects uh, across various sectors in New York. Astoria West, for example, has more than 500 units that are going to be available soon, um, as well as the rise and Nova in Long Island City. Previously overseeing a range of multifamily projects, Harshad is carrying his skills to another project, 141 Willoughby, which is the firm's first office building that is slated to be completed this year. Harshad himself has also completed the 160,000 square foot conversion of the former Schlitz Brewery and Bottling Building in Brooklyn. Uh, his design, the Jackson, a 70,000 square foot residential building in Long Island City was awarded the Global Future Design Award in 2020. So Harshad has got an incredible amount of experience and expertise working with developers, which is the main base of this conversation that we had. And in this episode, Harshad and I, we discuss empathizing with developers, you know, aligning business and design interests and actually understanding the anxieties of the developer. We talk about how to prevent adversarial relationships with developer clients. And we also talk about how to grow a firm with developer clients for long-term relations. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Arshad Pillai. Hey, Enix Sears here from Business of Architecture. And if you run an architectural practice, then probably one of the most difficult parts about running your practice is making sure you get your fees right, getting the right fee for the job. Because if you undercharge, ultimately, as you know, what ends up happening is you get to the end of the fee and there's still more job left. In that case, you're juggling to try to rob Peter to pay Paul, stealing from a more profitable project to support the less profitable projects. And on the flip side, you probably don't want to charge your clients absorbently too much than you actually need to get the project done. So the question is, how do you charge the right fee? Well, one resource that's been lacking in the architecture industry for a long time now is some sort of guide or comparison about what architecture firms actually charge. If you try to run a Google search on it, what do architects charge, you'll find some outdated information that's wildly inaccurate. And so I just want to record this quick little video to let you know and get to so you can look forward to something that we're doing here at Business of Architecture, which is we will be launching a comprehensive fee report talking about and just revealing what architectural practices around the United States and elsewhere are actually charging, how they set their fees. Do they do percentage of construction costs? Is it stipulated some? Is it hourly not to exceed? Also, what are the particular amounts? We're really excited about this because ever since we started, uh, founded Business of Architecture over 10 years ago, this has been a common question is like, is my pricing right? Is my pricing right? And so this is the question that we hope to answer when we release in December, we'll be releasing uh, this fee report. Now, one of the advantages is of us as a consulting agency is that we can put out this kind of information. Unfortunately, as you know, if you're in the United States, a couple of decades ago, the AIA got into big trouble because they published a list of basically like a fee chart, right? So like a fee matrix. And then the United States Justice Department decided that that was price fixing. It was it was causing a monopoly. And so they got in big trouble for doing that. Well, fortunately, from our perspective, we're not limited to talk about fees because we're not an organization. We're not a membership organization. We don't represent architecture as a whole. We're simply a consultancy. And as a matter of fact, our job and our business is to help architectural practices to succeed. So this is why we're super excited about this. So this is just a heads up. Make sure you keep your eyes out on your inbox. If you're not already on our email list, head over to businessofarchitecture.com. Make sure you sign up for our free live video training, and then you'll automatically get put onto our email list. So you will be the first to be notified when we release the fee and compensation 
report, all right? This is specifically tailored for you if you're a small architectural practice owner. You'll get to see very clearly what other people of similar size firms, similar size demographics, similar typologies are actually charging, how they set their fees. So you can start to answer that big question is, I wonder how I fit into what my competitors are charging. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice. Business of Architecture Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Harshad, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm well, thanks, Ryan. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. So you're one of the directors at um, Fogarty Finger. Um, you've had a very extensive career working with a lot of uh, commercial real estate in New York City. You were trained in Bombay and Texas, was that right? Yeah, University of Texas at Arlington, yep. And, and you've, you've had experience of working in Bombay as well as in, in New York. Yep. Excellent. And how long have you been at, at Fogarty Finger? Um, I, it's come nine years, nine years this month. So I started in 2013. Got it. And before that, you were at Handel Architects. I was at Handel Architects for about okay. seven years there. And before Great. that, I worked, I was at a small uh, design studio in Tribeca called Dine Murphy Wood. And I primarily mm-hmm. worked with uh, Nick Dine, who was an interior designer, furniture designer, and a mentor. And and how would you describe your role at Fogarty Finger? So I'm a director. So I'm one of two. I'm half of the ground up portfolio in in the company. Um, mm-hmm. So I have a, a studio of about twenty architects, um, and we do um, development projects, multifamily, um, you know, large scale repositioning, and office buildings in New York City. In Jersey City, mm. and what was your journey to becoming an associate or becoming one of the directors, rather? So I started. So I was at Hendel for about seven years, um, and I had a fantastic time there. I couldn't be. I was very grateful for the experiences that I had. Um, uh, one of my very close friends, who's also a director at Fogarty Finger, was you know asked me if I wanted to join this place because at that time Fogarty Finger was essentially a, a commercial interior design practice with a small like a very nascent and fast growing ground up business uh, mm. portfolio so I joined sort of with the implicit mandate to help grow the portfolio um, so I joined as an associate um, and you know immediately I started working in on projects in Jersey City with small teams and that was nine years ago um, and you know over the years we've been uh, building the portfolio, building client relationships, um, maintaining design intent, you know, you know, maintaining sort of like the design output that we were, that brought our clients to us. That's been a big part, big part of that, uh, that journey um, to now, I believe I ha- I I can't, like, I think I have like seven or eight projects on the board between construction and, and uh, what we're designing right now. And, possibly about I think about three million square feet in projects just essentially on on my table wow so so was this a, a kind of a department inside of the company that you've really helped grow what was Fogarty finger doing but prior to that so in so, the, in, in so the practice is to yeah the practice is Chris Fogarty and Robert finger uh, yeah. Chris Fogarty and their founding partners out of SOM and Chris Fogarty uh, it runs uh, the the ground up the base building, the ground up studio, um, and that was that is basically what I have pl- played a role in developing over the past nine years. Mm-hmm. Got it. And obviously, commercial real estate in New York is no walk in the park. You're probably in one of the most aggressive real estate environments on the planet. Yeah. Um, w- how have you been growing? What have been some of the challenges that you've been experiencing? And you know, how do you how do you how do you prevent yourselves from becoming one of the 
developers victims if you like yeah so so the the best way to approach it is to not like we talked about previously is to not um uh, come at it like that right so right. you know the early on you know in my conversations with chris Fogarty when we would work through projects i i realized it picked up really fast is that the best way to have a good meeting is to first address the owner's anxieties mm -hmm. and then you realize the best way to um have a great meeting with any individual is to first address their anxieties right like whether it is your your people on your staff or an intern or your boss or your client and once you kind of um you know once you kind of make that a habit and you start aligning yourself with your your client and understand where he's coming from like you empathize with that right so and that way you can manage your own expectations and sort of back into whatever your and what and and sort of derive creative satisfaction out of that um out of the parameters or within the parameters that you set for yourself because creative output does not is does not have much to do with budget mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying so like there's so our you know we're about a, we're a practice of about 120 architects um, but half of us, roughly a little less than half of us do buildings. And, but when I started at Fogarty Finger, I think I was employee number 26, 29, I don't remember. Um, and, and mostly it was an interior design studio and we had, we had to, um, do our first, like our first three years, all the projects that we delivered, designed and delivered right through, through TCO and had to be on very limited budgets internally. Like, you know, we bought those projects, like the 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 interior, the commercial interior and, and the multifamily interior design uh, part of the office paid for my lost leaders. Mm -hmm. um, and what we learned, so that, so those lessons that we learned over, through those, you know, being in the trenches over the first three or four years was something that we kind of tried to take, like never lose, take it along with us through the journey, which is, um, you know, it's not where you, which is you have, we still think like, and we still practice like a scrappy young office. We still um, make, and we still, at, at that point, we knew, you know, even though the projects were smaller and the budgets weren't great, we knew the differentiator was always going to be our design output. And mm. so like, how do you like those, those, that muscle memory, you know, like how do you design within a like a, a time constraint on a fast track project with a limited budget, if you know, and ha and produce buildings that are you know considered uh, well designed by our peers, and maintain that quality that you know keep those habits, keep you know keep that muscle memory as the projects get bigger, and that's kind of mm -hmm. been both the challenge and sort of the um, the push, the drive for us to you know just over the years yeah it, it's it's quite a, a big growth that you've seen at fogarty finger um from 25 to 120 people and and you know you, you've made that move from kind of more interiors to now full ground up buildings well, we're, right now we're a rounded studio so i i consider our practice to be a four three little studios so we're mm -hmm. you know we have the commercial interior design then we have the multifamily interior design that works with the the ground up base building, and then mm -hmm. we have the ground up base building design um, studio. So it's like three little practices that we kind of uh, cross pollinate staff and talent with. And and was the kind of the development of the business a strategic structure? So did you guys at some point sit down and say, this is how we want to structure the business in the future? Or did it happen more organically through the seizing of opportunities that emerged or a combination of both? Well, it, so it, it kind of just, yeah, it grew organically, right? So, and it just is in the, the, the practice, Chris Fogarty and Robert Finger, Robert Finger is an interior designer and Chris Fogarty is an architect, you know? And so it's just, um, kind of in there inherently. In there, it's baked yeah. into the the 
the system, I guess that's not a good word, but it's just baked into the practice, right? And so, and then, um, and yeah, so, and basically what we've been trying to do is just get the the base, at least my, get the base building um, portion of the portfolio up to scratch, right? And mm -hmm. and sort of like be, uh, it's, it's ne we never see, the, the studios are never looked at in a, we don't look at each other in a competitive sense, but we're, you know, we're trying to grow independently, but at the same time maintain sort of like the, the collaborative mm -hmm. um, aspects of the original practice. So, so when you're going through this process of aligning yourselves or trying to understand developers' anxieties, what does that process look like? Oh, it and it just... It's it's a lot of meeting. It's a lot of meetings, and it's a lot of um, post um, meeting analysis, right? So mm -hmm. um, there's nothing worse uh, than presenting something to an owner and missing the point, right? Like there's nothing there's nothing worse than saying uh, I got you, Mister Client, on a Tuesday, and then next Tuesday presenting something and the client goes that's not what we talked about so mm -hmm. that and so the the first part is to just understand what the point of um you know the next few iterative uh steps are um and and a lot of that comes from kind of understanding just having like post meeting conversations internally about what the owner's priorities are and once we and 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 it that could vary right so that could vary from a large developer or it could um a, a large multifamily developer uh, to a small multifamily developer or an office building uh client who has you know different priorities in that period of time so like we that's that's kind of the goal like trying to get to understand what their priorities are addressing that and then kind of taking the process forward so the client mm. always feels that their needs are being met and 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 what are some of the things that you've found that are common, if you like, with anxieties that developers are are facing, and are, and are these anxieties things that kind of they're constantly shifting and changing with market conditions, and then it means you guys have got to be quite aware of, you know, got you have your finger on the pulse, as it were. So, I mean, look, there, we're we're plugged into the business of real estate, so like the number one uh, issue is um, getting. Um, the the right product um delivering on time um like so an efficient schedule and the third bit is just the cost of construction the cost of um you know the end product so the hard cost mm -hmm. so it's those three so it's time money and what are you putting out there right like what is yeah. the product because as a as an architect for say multifamily projects what we're looking at is if I start a project today, that pro that those residential units are delivered three years from now, right? So and so dialing into what the right unit mix is, what the right unit sizes are, um, what the right programming is for each project, depending on where they sit. So like currently right now, for instance, we're having a conversation with an owner for a relatively small building, and we're you know, we're trying to understand the value of the commercial aspect of the retail aspect of that mixed use building. And we're even, you know, are we're even proposing that maybe there isn't any value for retail in that project, which is mm -hmm. sort of not something that we normally do. It's not, you know, but it's it's something like it's it's an idea that if we don't table, we would never get a reaction to and we would never um uh, no, right? Whether that was the right. right decision or not, and but when we when we take those approaches, right? We don't. It, this doesn't come from a. It's we don't question the wisdom of an owner, but we sort of we almost partake in their thinking process, um, mm -hmm. and sometimes we push it uh, to a place where you know they may push back and say no, we do need this, but then but then they appreciate that we're there with them testing out different ideas on a pretty mm -hmm. structural level. We don't, you know, we don't make 
we we take we don't necessarily always buy into their assumptions and it's not from a point of arrogance or you know to challenge them we don't know any better than what you know it's it's their skin in the game but it comes from a place of experience that we've had prior and it comes from a rational place so it's like it's yeah so it, there's a lot of humility involved cuz they're that you know we're we're telling someone who's an expert at what they do that maybe that's mm-hmm. not the route that they should be going with your client base your client portfolio at the moment are a lot of these clients the same clients that you had when the business was much smaller and you were focusing on those kind of interior fit outs and then you've gone for a process of growing with those developers as they as they've been maturing and they've started taking on bigger projects or have you kind of moved into working with a different scale of developer mm-hmm. and if if that's the case how do you kind of start working with a developer who perhaps already has well trodden relationship with with architects in new york so it's a bit of both um we don't so i when i started i worked so my clients essentially are the clients i had when i started working um as their development clients but they were much smaller much younger right. um and uh we've kind of grown with them which has kind of been yes. one of the most like gratifying parts of this this entire journey with the with mm. chris fogarty is that um you know maintaining those relationships right like so one of the qualities that you you pick up immediately is you have to build and maintain relationships and that comes you know and and the only way to do that is to uh it's it's a demonstrative process right you have to show yeah a you deliver projects right we're we're in a we're in a competitive environment where extremely talented architecture firms are delivering projects all the time so and you know and so how do you maintain that relationship it's sort of like you have it's there is there's a certain aspect of uh um you know of sort of you you have to keep um showing your cards you have to keep you know explaining to the clients and and kind of de- demonstrate that your um your your processes and how you're thinking and you know like the the bits that we just talked about where you where you challenge their thought processes um and when you do that you kind of earn their respect and they kind of feel they come to you our clients have started to come to us with um um not not so much with here's a project here's what we want to do we find our clients come to us and say hey what do you think we should do here like what mm-hmm. can we do right um to a certain extent which is which is extremely gratifying yeah um and so we start and we started with uh, i started with these clients you know couple of client uh parties that um in nine years ago that are still with us and growing and along the way we picked up you know some new clients some old relationships that i kind of rekindled and have they've become really nice um owners clients for us as well um in in terms of you know developing this kind of specialist knowledge um and expertise with with certain uh, developer clients have you ever had the experience where the developer client is hiding you or keeping you to themselves and how do you how do you kind of keep expanding the network and finding new clients if you like no i like our our clients are pretty in fact i have clients who recommend us to other clients you know i have um we we have a we have a almost a peer like relationship with most of our owners and i'll mm-hmm. I'll just go a step back i mean i I lied one of our clients who was at an interior commercial interior design um, um, owner um we just designed and built um uh, a four hundred and fifty thousand uh rentable square foot office building in downtown brooklyn so like that's uh that's a transition that um that happened and that was super pr- fruitful it's a beautiful building in downtown brooklyn um yeah no so i you know i don't we don't uh we find that our clients sort of like work with us um mm-hmm. give us references um connect us with other owners i mean it doesn't yeah. happen as frequently as we would want it to but it does happen yeah sure um obviously with developers you know there's lots of 
things there's lots of risk involved right the developers are typically taking they're taking financial risks they're leveraging um resource they're taking risks with their investors finances yep. sometimes we see situations happen where the architect is inadvertently absorbing more risk than they anticipated in a project so for example an architect might get themselves involved in a contract where it wasn't paid when get paid but then the developer has issues with you know receiving money or income from their investors yep. and then it puts the architect in a situation where now they're having to you know pay for their pay for the project to be kind of completed but they're not going to get any of the upside how do yep. you prevent or negotiate when those sorts of challenges arise so and yeah and you know that's that's happened to us you know mm -hmm. and and that's a judgment call you make right and um there is you know we it's 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 a judgment call that you make based on the depth of the relationship that you have with the owners right and it's a judgment call you make based on um the honest sincere conversation that you have with the owners um mm -hmm. And and sometimes you had to draw the line. Sometimes you had to draw a partial line. Uh, we've done that, and mm -hmm. you know, we and then we've received uh, our our funds. And but the goal is to come out at the other end when the dust settles with the, with your relationship intact. Mm -hmm. um, if if it is worth saving, and like we've not, we I haven't met a client to date, and I've been really lucky um, that we've not wanted to continue to engage in perpetuity. So so you know different and you just it's it's a case by case you can't there's no way you can draw you know you can kind of strategize or or make rules or have metrics for those especially at our scales right mm -hmm. um these are all conversations over the phone or and you know like friendly negotiations that you eventually try to get past yeah so that so there isn't a point when enough is enough you know, the the a line has been crossed in terms of okay, this is not this is no longer going to work with us as as We've a, come as a close. relationship. <laughs> um, but it's not, but not close enough to end a relationship, but close enough sure. to go. Uh, it you know, we have really healthy, strong uh, mm. relationships with our clients. Have you ever structured the way that your fees are delivered? Um, in alignment with the cash flow or the financial complications or structure that the client is using. And what I mean by that is I've often spoken to lots of architects where they've actually recognized that, you know, one of the uh, benefits that an architect can, can bring is some sort of fluidity with how their fees are actually structured. And developers are quite, you know, they'll appreciate it in many cases if, if an architect takes a, takes a, a, a thoughtful risk i.e you know we're going to delay our payment you know if you if you pay us in a kind of regular pattern like we asked that's one fee but if you want us to defer the payment until we've got planning approvals in place then we can do that but then there's a much bigger uplift and we'll mm. take a base rate so you start structuring your your fees in a in a more of a, a deal making way which is performance based and you know it's kind of speaking the language of the of the developer i mean I'm, i asked that just because i've seen lots of architects who have been quite creative in how they've done that and it's it's worked out has that been something that you guys have ever done so not not on the front end um but i'm trying to figure out a um uh a proposal right now where I, we're talking about this is a client that we know and he self performs his buildings mm -hmm. um and we're you know usually so like in the you're there's you're well familiar with the process uh the the phases in design documentation and construction and the the construction administration in new york city um and i'm mm -hmm. as i'm sure is in, in in Europe as well tends to be a, a fee bleeder um and what I'm trying to do mm -hmm. is kind of dial back that so and move the move the money over into the process the design and documentation process and because it's i'm at a you know is i have a self-performing owner who who knows what he builds well um and he doesn't have that adversarial relationship that um would be between an owner a, uh, and a general contractor that an architect right. mediates right so 
Um, and that way, that's 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 a window. It's it's something we're trying to, we're working through right now. Mm-hmm. And it and that again is part of sort of like the relationship play. Like it's we're only doing it because it's a client that we uh, hold very dear to our hearts, and you know we're mm-hmm. we're friends with. Um, yeah, and like and the I guess an important part of this is that I would not do it any other way. In that um, we wake up. And we come into work because we design, mm-hmm. you know, and we and then we and we design and we meet design intent, right? So um, the the you know the first the initial process of sort of like the design documentation phase is this, this the concept schematic and the design development is tends to be extremely inefficient, mm-hmm. and the one thing that you realize very early in this in in this profession is it has to be inefficient because the moment you make design efficient your output tends to be cookie cutter right so the the challenge for me in the the last nine years or so has always been how do i make you have to as a practice make room for inefficiency in the design process right because rigorous design is inefficient Mm-hmm. If your design process is efficient, you're you're designing, you're you you know it's you're just your output is cookie cutter. It trends to yeah. become that. So, um, if I were to structure like like I'm doing right now, I would sort of load up the front end and make room mm-hmm. for make sure that what you know at the end of because we wouldn't want to negotiate a fee and spend a year designing it and then two years building it and not want to take pictures of the building. Yeah. Right. We want to get excited. So right now, like a a few of my, the guys on my team, so a couple of, I think three projects are going out and get taking pictures of the buildings and, you know, they come back with photographs and we're all excited about the building because, and then we talk about like, we made this move here and they're all small. They're like, you know, between 150,000 square feet to 100,000 square feet. The little mm-hmm. projects in 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 Long Island City, but it's that's like that's the yeah, that's the what do you call it um, uh, the fruit at the end. I'm 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 at a loss for metaphors right now, but you know, <laughs> but that's like that's <laughs> um, and like that's what you look forward to, right? Like it, to have something. Like imagine if that was a building that we didn't care about, like at mm-hmm. the end of three years. So. Um, yeah, it's basically there's no there's no project in this office that we don't make room for design and design every aspect of it um, with a lot of care. That, that that's really interesting the way you've put that that you know design is inherently inefficient and if you want to design well then that means that there is going to be more iteration there's going to be more rigor that's that's applied to it and this is where you know this is this is the kind of the, at the very crux of it, the difficulty of running an architecture business is that's the, a paradox you know. in our process, right? So, like any business business processes, if you go to any business school, I've never been to business schools, but um, you, I, I bet it's just about cutting fat and being being efficient, and that's mm-hmm. the paradox in our profession, our processes. In is is that the the first part of it has to be inefficient and. Mm-hmm. The process has to the entire the big you know the whole practice as a whole has to allow for that, and that has to do with you know how you manage your finances, how you manage your your schedule, what kind of staff you hire. It's all driven towards that, and then having a mm-hmm. robust uh, uh, you know and you don't want you don't want to cut corners when you're documenting. Mm-hmm. You know, so we take our as as a practice, we deliver. We, you know, we say it's it's soup to nuts when you come to us, whether it is um, base building or interior design. So if you come to us, what we want to do is to design the outside, the inside, and take you through TCO. Um, and you know, so your 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 tenants or your your buyers can move into the building while we're there. That's that's yeah. kind of the promise. Um, and at the end, you get a beautiful building. So, so what sorts of things do you keep a close eye on there then when you're, you know, you're going through the inefficient part of design and how do you help, you know, kind of 
allow the client to come along with you on that journey of inefficiency yeah it's, or, it's, or, or, or of the, the emergent process which yeah can be... so our magic sauce is um you know is that we have a very horizontal um design process so like so in terms of um decision making um you know the principals and the founding partners are involved at a very close level um and through from from like the concept stage to to schematic and it's all done um on on pdf so there's no printing there's no pinups um mm-hmm. and it's all done three dimensionally so there are no design decisions made in elevation and i i would you practically know so like it, whether it is even a um so we've developed what we did was we developed a very simple internal um, sort of like design sensibility in terms of uh, representational sensibility. So all our 3D models kind of look the same. So nobody in the mm-hmm. in the company uh, renders class, right? Nobody's sitting there doing photorealistic renderings of glass, right? That for me is the you know, that's the worst end of the spectrum. Like that's, yeah. so we know what glass looks like. So we talk, so the conversations, because we have this representational sensibility that's kind of established throughout the studio, the conversations are always immediately about architecture, about space, about um, really like, and, and that we, we can dive right through because there's no, you're not squinting your eyes wondering what that is. As soon as we, so that's the clarity that we've established over the last, I think we did that in the first four years, I believe. And mm-hmm. once we did that, the, the design process got a lot simpler. Um, right. And, and it allowed for that rigor to, to take place. So like, you know, the, you know, and what, the other thing that we did was we encourage, um, you know, uh, across the board, we encourage design input and we make sure that people who kind of show that instinct who have the ability, doesn't matter what their seniority level is, mm-hmm. um, get kind of are fed enough work and are kind of and are given the opportunity to grow and develop and take people along with them as they, uh, you know, over the years. And so we've developed sort of like a shorthand between the the design partners and the and the principals and the directors and the you know the designers in the in the company some who are you know who have been for a while and some who are kind of learning and coming up we have sort of like and and so so the conversations are very simple they can happen at um in you know at a like a on a screen where we sit in a conference room and we like do a page turn and spin around the building or they can just be over the shoulder but the the representation like sensibility is the same so that uniformity kind of helps us kind of get past that how, how do you how do you kind of keep an eye on you know the profit margins then of a of the project that you're working on whilst managing this emergent process of design or the inefficient process of design how does what's the relationship between you know the, the the fees that are available and what the what the the rigor that is that everyone wants to put into the final product yeah um how do i manage it uh, barely so you know it's um it, we're at a stage you know i've been here for nine years and we've we've kind of developed our our clientele and our client base and our scales uh to a place where we have um like enough volume that uh that that even you compare it to the size of our studio and the projects that we do kind of allows for a little bit of that process like Mm -hmm. you know allows for fluff um and it's it's not perfect right like you know some you know some projects um when we land in a design and an owner loves it immediately, that's sort of like magical. Um, yep. And, you know, and it should come from us. Like, uh, and, and some, most of our design issues are really not driven by owners. It's basically us internally kind of going through the process. So like, you know, there's, it, you, you kind of, you, you we have like in our, like, you know, we have a really, you know, have an amazing CFO who should probably be a yoga teacher. She's got this really even keel, <laughs> Stella, and 
And but she kind of keeps us on check and sort of like, you know, gives us updates on how we're doing and, um, you know, on each project, um, what is our monthly outgoing for each studio per se, mm -hmm. um, you know, and what is our staff month cost? You know, with, with those metrics, we kind of like we have the tools in place to put together sort of like a fee schedule. Mm -hmm. How does how does design get managed from a leadership perspective? Do you do you have like a, a like a level of transparency where project architects know what the budget is, or is there a mechanism for translating the budget to hours, and then hours are distributed to the team, and then they start to no, you know, there's, um, there's, a, there's a framework I, involved. Yeah, I think or... like I think once you get it to the granular level of an of the of hourly um, wages. Um, that sort of like, I think it tends to become a little meaningless for me. Right. Um, we have, the way we do it is we assume that there's, there's um, something baked in there to allow for inefficiencies. Um, mm -hmm. And then we have a calendar. So like what we do is we put out, at the start of every project, I put out a schedule for owners and clients and we, and we have our milestones, our documentation milestones, our filings and, you know, city agency milestones. And we have ownership milestones. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, like sometimes when owners come to us and say, you know, we want to uh, you know, fast track this and we'd like to be in the ground by X. We go, that's great. If we get these 15 decisions that remain unchanged by this date, we can deliver. So it's sort of like a sliding scale that we give to them and that's how we kind of keep all the parties honest and and it's not a static schedule so what we do is you know every two weeks or so we'll represent that schedule and we'll draw a red line where we are on that day and we'll say we're here today this is what we talked about two weeks ago these are the decisions due and that's where we are you know and that's so you know maybe this has to move forward or we're doing well we're okay you know and and not it's not uncommon where the client says all right we haven't you know we haven't given you what we wanted but you got to hold that line you know and depending on uh, you know how feasible it is we'll either hold that line or we'll meet some, meet them somewhere mm -hmm. in between that's a very nice way of looking at it is you know kind of presenting it back to the client as in you know here's a, here's a key set of decisions that you need to make yeah we're going to be providing you the information and tools to be able to make those decisions yeah and you know if they're not made then it's going to start moving and shifting yeah shifting the whole and, and we keep around. and we keep it alive right and then what's what's yeah. great is that then we can even reanalyze that at, at the end of the project so mm -hmm. we're doing there are these clients who are and we're doing another building. Um, we just finished two, and so when we talked about this this third building with them uh, last month, uh, you know, the question was like, so what's our schedule? And and we we're like, here's our schedule, and then here's how it compares to the other two buildings that we did for you, right? And that's a very easy conversation, and it's very honest, and it's very like you said, it's extremely transparent. Mm -hmm. um, and the goal isn't to sort of like, again, it's never adversarial, right? Like, it's like, okay, I, I get that. Just the other day, a, a client was like, you know, our 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 contract documents deadline is, is it's too late. We got to do something. And I was like, hey, we, this is, a, this is, we've just moved it out two weeks from a schedule we gave you a year and a half ago, a year ago. And he was like, oh, no, no, it's not. We're not saying it's on you. But it is too late. So how, and so then it becomes a, like a collaborative conversation. It's like, oh, okay. Um, so what can I do? Like, so let's talk about advanced packages. Let's talk about issuing backgrounds early, um, so that you know you can buy concrete or you can put you know sets on the street for your buys, concrete and mechanical and facade. We can work with you. Like, it, and that's once it once the tone is collaborative. The process is entirely different from when you know the architect climbs up and the client, and it suddenly there's this weird energy, and mm -hmm. then and then it's hard to kind of um, um, sort of come out of that. You know, it takes a lot of effort and it it becomes a little hokey. So we try to make everything as as collaborative as possible, and it's the the only way to do it is to just be really transparent, right? And we've had clients come to us with 
extremely aggressive schedules. And mm-hmm. the goal is never to say, no, that's not doable. The goal is to always say, this is, we can, so here's how off you are from a typical, what can we change in these milestones and what can we change in these deliverables? Or if you want to go and get in the ground three months earlier than you would normally, we can do a sprint just to get to that. And we can sort of like, you know, um, um, over design the, the, the pile caps so that if the columns move, et cetera, like, you know, we can, and those are the conversations that we have with, uh, and we have sincere conversations with owners, with with engineers, and we say, "Hey, look, you know, so and so wants to get in the ground by this date because he's got, you know, he's got resources that he doesn't want to leave idle from another project. Right. What can we do?" And then we say, "All right, if I'm going to devote uh, resources to this sprint to get you engaged, I'm going to be light on the other aspects of the project. So this is what happens to the schedule. So it's never like." It's never like, oh, we got to do it. We're going to do it or we cannot do it, right? It's no one. We tried to make sure that like, because I work with really great guys in the company, right? And the mm-hmm. um, who come to work happy, I hope. And, you know, and but the the flip side is like my duty towards them is to make sure that they have um, reasonable schedules or if their schedules are aggressive, we have an honest conversation about it, right? And we say, okay, this, you know, and it's and it's sort of like taking ownership of those honor, of of those decisions, and saying, hey, look, the next two weeks are going to be rough, mm. but like, you know, let's see if you can cruise after this one. So, like, if you have a hard deadline, let's see if you can get some, you know, easy time for about a week, you know, take comps, etc. So, it's. You know, and and that's kind of the balance, right? Like you're you're always trying to move parts, like keep an eye on the the owner's anxiety, keep an eye on um, the staff's anxiety. There's nothing worse than being sort of like an intermediate. When you're a junior, you're just happy to work. I remember, I still remember, like just wanting to, what's next? Like, what can I learn? Like, you know. But when yeah. when you when you get to a place where you know a bit. Um, and you want to know more and you want to make that leap from like intermediate to senior, there's nothing worse than working in sort of an information vacuum. And mm-hmm. like that carter of, of staff, of architects are, you know, are sort of like what make the practice hum and sharing information and like being honest with them and talking to them about successes and failures, right. Um, on a, on a very, on a peer, like on a peer level is mm-hmm. kind of critical to keep keeping that morale up. So it, and we kind of factor all of that when we, when we chart out like the next years. <laughs> so how, how do you, how do you um, structure like performance reviews or um, career nurturing and evolution inside of the inside of the firm and you know help people from take from that intermediate level step up into yeah. into leadership positions we take it very seriously i have like in this office and so this is the and this comes from uh the founding partner chris fogarty and robert finger like they they take it extremely seriously we talk about um staff we talk about individuals from a um a fulfillment point of view more often than um, I have ever experienced or heard in my life. Um, and and I, I don't know if I'm an outlier or we are an outlier in that sense, but it is, it is a very uh, sincere approach. And like we have started uh, year end reviews already. Right. So, and we make sure that it is a, you know, it, and it's a, and it's a process where, you know, the team member and the interv- the interviewee and the interviewer um, talk over a document that the interviewee um, fills out. And so it's sort of like, it structures the conversation as opposed to how are you doing? And, you know, you need to do X, Y, and Z. It's, it's, it's articulated and it's formalized. And that's the only bit of bureaucracy that exists in this company. And I think it's the best place to put that, um, you know, I wouldn't even call it bureaucracy. It's sort of like a structured articulation of someone's, um, um, you know, aspirations. Um, so, so yeah, and we talk about um, leadership. We talk about growth. We talk about promotions. Um, you mm-hmm. know, we have 
but three years ago we kind of like I was hired as an associate associate, but three years ago we started this process where we um, the the leadership, the directors and up started um, uh, talking about um, promotions internally and whom would we want to be uh, uh, to move up, who would um, accelerate. Um, and we created sort of like metrics for that that we have a conversation about but 15 of us have a conversation about the rest of the office um, mm -hmm. once a year. Uh, in fact, I think this year we're going to do a, a follow-up conversation, all to say that it's a very, it's a very thoughtful process. Um, aside from that, like on a personal level, I try to talk to as many people as possible. Um, when they join the team, I have conversations with them just to understand like what is their, like what is their career arc? Like what is their life priorities? Right. So, yeah, um, right. you know, I'll, like I'll, give you an example um there was this one individual whom i thought was was great and i was kind of trying to get her to um yeah i was kind of loading up her up with uh with responsibility incrementally and she was kind of delivering and um a year in um she, she said hey look i really appreciate this but i really don't want to be you like and so and so you know and what i realized was that like i was sort of projecting my ambition on her and mm -hmm. what what i loved about the conversation she was just like i need to take a little more time for myself you know mm -hmm. and i was just like that's probably the best you know conversation i've had with any team member in my life or someone just goes so and so the approach to these conversations with 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 team members are are never like this is what I expect of you. It's more like there are no wrong answers as long as you mm -hmm. come into work and you give me your hundred percent, right? And that's mm -hmm. all that matters. Like as long as the the moment there is a a sense of insincerity, that kind of starts the dysfunction in the relationship. So as long as there is a a clear um, understanding that there's you know I'm being sincere and they're being sincere to me and they're coming into work. That's all that matters, right? And then the rest yeah. of it is up to the individual and how they kind of scale up and down or how they calibrate their own careers. And if there is anything articulated that I want to do X or I don't want to do Y, then we'll put it on the map and we'll say, let's talk in four months about how we're doing. Mm -hmm. And let's just be honest. Oh, that didn't happen. Like, I wanted you to do X, Y, and Z. I couldn't make these opportunities happen. And so let's try in two months. And then we actually put those on the calendar and we have conversations. It doesn't happen with everybody, but it's, you know, it's whoever kind of takes that. Um, when you, when you're having a, a kind of a career review or a performance review with a member of, uh, of, of your team and you start to identify say skill gaps or knowledge gaps and they've, you know, articulated, I want to be here in five years time in my career. And then, and then you might, identify okay well then this this and this and this needs to be in place or how do how how does the company help facilitate that or like you know do, do you invest in trainings or is it more like experience based making sure people are allocated onto the right projects that they're working on the right oh things? yeah absolutely in fact yeah. like you know we even have people who like i was talking about um, cross pollination between the studios. So there'll be people mm -hmm. on the interior design studios going like, "Hey, um, we're I'd like to do buildings now, right?" And that gets so if someone puts their hand up, that sort of like that gets uh, when when the directors sit down, they go, "So and so said she wants to do buildings," and we go, "Okay," but it doesn't happen that week. It doesn't happen that month. But it is never. What we make sure is that we never it never drops off the radar. So mm -hmm. at first it's a conversation and then it's like, look, we I, we hear you, I hear you. Um, we're gonna try and make that move over. Here's what I have. And so right now, like right now is not when it's gonna happen. Let's talk in a month, you know? And as soon as you talk to someone in, a, in, an, in an honest um, way and treat them like, you know, adult human beings, it's, and you just go like as a peer, like you know, there's there are no secrets here, right? Like there's, we we want you to f have a fulfilled career in this practice. Um, so if it's not there, and if it has to be here, these are our options, and mm -hmm. it's probably in April or it's probably in May. What do you think? And then if they go like, oh, well, this is that's too that's you know that's too far out. 
you know, and then we take the conversation from there. So we do that. Sure. So we'll so we'll move people across studios. Um, we'll we'll like there's this targeted growth. You know, there's milestones. Like so, so for an individual, um, if you know, if they go, or we can. I I've done this where I've said like, okay, in by next year, I want you to run coordination meetings by yourself. Like call them you know, like call coordination meetings, have the confidence to, um, and this is what I, this is kind of what resonated with, resonates with people is that when you, so what we do in this business, right? Like in, uh, just to digress a little bit, our knowledge base is accretive. None of it is rocket science. Like we don't, yeah. there's no, we're not doing advanced math. It's, it's all accretive, extremely logical knowledge, but it's really vast. So what I tell anybody who listens is that you have to know enough to get you to a confidence level where you can say, I don't know stuff. Does that make sense? So, yeah. And so yeah. like, you know, for someone to run a team with consultants who are, who are like, you know, 10 years, their senior, 15 years, their senior, it's intimidating. But if they've been around the block a couple of times or been through the cycle twice, and they incrementally increase their knowledge base. They can be in uh, in, a, in a meeting and say, "I know that doesn't work, but can you tell me what is the maximum length of refrigerant pipes from mm -hmm. X to Y, or remind me what that is?" Like that confidence to be able to say, "I don't know, but I know enough," is is where we try to get people to. Mm -hmm. When when do you well? What's the relationship like between the client and the team? On the team uh, on your side it's um in fact it's gotten even more horizontal with uh with uh everybody being remote and on headphones mm -hmm. so you know prior uh when we had in-person meetings at conference rooms you never had the entire team sitting in meetings with the clients right it would be just the key people now when we have these virtual meetings everybody listens in right mm -hmm. it's an hour that nobody's working, but it's an hour that everybody's kind of taking in and the interactions, involved. you know, you know, um, the flip side to that is that, and we, you hear about this a lot is that kids don't know how to read rooms, et cetera, but let's just put that to aside for a second. But now people understand they have a window into client and architect interactions, right? Like they, they, they watch it get awkward. They, they watch pushbacks, they watch. So, there is so, so we're finding we found like certain individuals during the pandemic in fact kind of grew in confidence and maybe it helped that they weren't in the room and they had to sort of like the uh this i guess safety is not the right word but this kind of distance of being remote and they were able to express themselves and that translated mm -hmm. into um you know when we came back that translated into confidence again um but generally i feel like you know, we we connect our 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 anybody could be an intermediate or our juniors with the client group if we think that they can deliver. It's never it's never bottlenecked by um by project managers or directors. Like and and we try to keep that. And that's sort of like the small practice DNA that we're mm -hmm. trying to keep um alive as we as we grow. To to conclude the conversation here, I know um, all the financial news, Bloomberg's been reporting that we're about to enter into, well, the, U the US certainly has a 100% chance of entering into a recession by the end, you know, within the within the next 12 months or so. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, architecture, construction, we're like the canary in the... In, in the mine, yeah. In yeah. the mines, if you like. What have you started seeing in terms of, um, a recession or the kind of economic changes that are happening at the moment? How are you seeing, you know, clients, you know, projects being put on pause, are clients becoming more cautious? Are you seeing developers, you know, just waiting, you know, when to deploy their, their cash or investors waiting? So um, there, there are two parts to that. So the, the, we find that the, because we're in the multifamily world, right, the, the the city cycle um, is a little different, um, and it's kind of independent, especially for us, uh, independent of of just the broader cycle. Um, and it 
oh, at least over the past two or three years, because it is driven by the state subsidy for affordable housing. That's mm-hmm. kind of like our wheelhouse. So we saw like we saw a huge spike um, last fall, and then since then we've seen a gradual slowdown. Um, and now we're trying to see. Not, we're starting to see a pickup, as a matter of fact, um, in conversations. The, so the phone is ringing. Uh, we're we're taking on. We're writing more proposals um, in the fall, um, and you know. So yeah. So that's generally like we're not right as of right now. Maybe there's a delay. You know, there's a five second delay from um, a recession being announced to when sort of the the funds. Uh, dry up, but you know, for as long as banks are lending, um, you know, there will be development, and there's a huge need for housing in in the country. There's a huge need for housing in the city mm-hmm. um, and in the tri-state area. So we're hoping, sort of like it, it's not, you know, we're definitely hoping it's not 2008, and we're hoping the slowdown isn't as severe as you know some might uh, predict. Brilliant. What's in store for the rest of the year and for 2023? Um, professionally, uh, let's see. We have – we're looking – we're giving Jersey City a hard look. We're trying to uh, kind of make some reconnections, and I think we're looking at some work over there. Um, we have some great projects that are coming online um, and, you know, and some really good projects in the outer boroughs in, in New York City that we're kind of – gearing up and very excited about amazing brilliant harshad thank you so much for this brilliant conversation thoroughly enjoyed um, speaking with you real deep Thanks, dive Ryan. into uh, in, into your practice into your career and your enormous expertise so thank you thanks thanks so much for having me this is a great conversation And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.